Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello. Hiya. My name is Russell. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Russell. Oh, thanks, Pat, for asking me to share this meeting. Thanks for your secretary commitment. Thanks all of you that are um, joining this meeting today from around the world. And those of you in Dublin, the physical home of this middle of the bed meeting. Middle of the bed with a thousand people. What a lovely way to spend a Monday evening. If you were in the exact middle of the bed with a thousand people, that'd probably be unhygienic and probably difficult to get out if you needed to go to the lavatory. But given that middle of the bed in this instance is a reference to a famous AA idiom, stay in the middle of the bed, stay in the meetings, I suppose, in the midst of the steps, in the midst of the, your relationship, your higher power and your sponsor and your sponsees. I suppose that's a bit safer. I love the Irish people. I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm pretty happy to be here. <sighs> it's about just what's today, like December the 7th or 8th or something like that. I got uh, clean and sober because I, I took drugs as well. I got clean and sober on December. The 13th, 2002, so December the 12th was my last day using, and um, yes, a lot has changed, and if I get to December the 13th, you know, in a, a week's time, that will be 18 years, thanks to the principles of AA, the members of the fellowship faith in a higher power. I suppose like listening to those readings at the beginning, what I'm struck by is the thoroughness and depth that is expressed in the written form of this program. You know, notably and obviously in the steps that the summit and conclusion of the 12 steps albeit a perennial and ongoing conclusion, a process rather than a destination, is um, the phrase, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. Those of you that are new, if you're anything like me when I was new, you won't be thinking about having a spiritual awakening. When I first went, to an AA meeting, it was not with my head filled with thoughts of having a spiritual awakening. I didn't at 19 years old, because that was the first time I went to an AA meeting, was when I was 19. And uh, you know, you're only supposed to start drinking in my country, England, when you're 18. So I guess I must have started a little bit earlier. And by the time I was 19, people were saying, you need to go to this thing called AA. And when I went there, I weren't looking for a spiritual awakening. And I actually, to be honest, didn't really want to stop drinking. Because for me, uh, as Clancy says, alcohol was not, was not my problem. Reality was my problem. Alcohol was my solution to the problem of reality and initially it kind of worked in that it provided a kind of anesthetic a barrier a distance and i've come to recognize now and maybe i've not even recognized maybe i just it was plain told because a lot of the things in fact anything that i say over this what seems like a ludicrously long period of time is it an hour really an hour because I, I think if you can't get the story into 15 minutes flat uh, then you're embellishing it but 
basically the first the, the thing that I have all of the things that are valuable to me are simply things that I've remembered that other people in this program have told me. Anything I say that sounds wise or intuitive or deeply true comes directly from the literature of this program or people with more time than me, sometimes with less time than me, that have taken the time to explain ideas to me. Anything I say that sounds like a bit crazy and mad and like it's being made up on the spot, it probably is. You might want to think twice before taking any of that stuff to heart. Having a spiritual awakening was not what I came to this program wanting. I suppose what I wanted was to address the problem that had caused me to start drinking in the first place. As a result of these steps, I now know that what, what that problem can be like loosely described as is feelings of worthlessness, alienation, sort of despair, emptiness, an inability to deal with my own emotions and an inability to deal with life on life terms. I only know that now because I've been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for a while and I've listened to what other people told me. When I first came in, I thought that, I suppose what I thought was I didn't fit in in the world. I didn't belong in the world. And I wasn't very, uh, weren't very happy. And thinking about it now, addictive tenacity like when I was a little kid the way that I used to uh, eat bars of chocolate was pretty intense you know I used to eat chocolate with, with a great deal of passion and I can still do it if anyone ever gets me like um, one of them boxes of roses or a good box of chocolates and um, for the Americans roses is a kind of a uh, very uh, British and indeed Eurocentric type of uh, chocolate snack that it's like comes in individually wrapped treats. Well, like now, if there's some of them in my house, I have to have a little ongoing negotiation with them, like whether or not I'm going to eat one or whether I'm going to eat a thousand of them or whether I'm going to eat the whole box. When I was a little kid taking on a packet of biscuits, I did so with some enthusiasm. What I'm saying is, is even before alcohol or drugs, it was clear that I had a problem. I'm thinking about it now, the sort of clinginess that I had with my mum was similarly an indication that I was looking for outside things to make me feel better about how I am you know like most things that I've done in my life I've done with a kind of mm, I suppose you could say a kind of devotion a kind of dedication a kind of uh, committedness I suppose like that what is spoken of in step 12 having you know having had a spiritual awakening in a way it was obvious that that was the problem. It was obvious that I needed a change of perspective. I needed a radical, a radically different way of looking at reality. But anyone that's new on this group, on this page, on this meeting, you know, if you're anything like me, all you'll be thinking about is, well, probably you might be thinking, I wish I could drink a bit more safely without the negative consequences of my drinking. Or you might be thinking, I wish I didn't have to feel so worthless and empty and i've spoken to a lot of alcoholics and drug addicts over the years and one of the things that i've found to be relatively consistent is that behind the facade and a variation of like e e endlessly variable habits and practices are feelings like emptiness loneliness worthiness worthlessness and inability to trust people not wanting to be on your own most alcoholics i've spoke to feel that way deep down and m most alcoholics and speaking for myself I, I was trying that's the problem that I was trying to deal with that's the problem that I was trying to solve first I reckon through um you know as I say through the way that I was eating food when I was little then when I was an adolescent through pornography through being really clingy in relationships by living endlessly in fantasy by watching tv the whole time and then when I first had a drink that just felt like a much more effective means for dealing with the way that I feel. For, it escalated pretty quick, my alcohol and drug use, and was sort of um, like, you know, anybody that's sort of ever like, like read a sort of a, a leaflet or a government pamphlet about problems with alcohol and drugs would kind of recognize the shape that my own 
problems with alcohol to look it got out of control really really fast it escalated really really quickly it got worse and worse it was not something that i could control and like the pro the, the 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 problems that it caused for me got worse and worse really really quickly sometimes now the truth is this program has been so effective at changing me changing my perspective that i find it hard to remember i find it hard to remember the person i was i find it hard to imagine how desperate and unhappy and lonely i was not that i don't still feel pain not that i don't still feel suffering not that i don't still feel inferiority and inadequacy i always have a lot of material to take to the meetings that i attend i sometimes go to men's groups so i find that very helpful i pray and meditate every day I sponsor other people and I have a sponsor. I read the literature every day. I like that 24 hours a day, that little black book. I read that. But, you know, sometimes I can forget how severe and serious it was. I'll give you a little rough idea just, you know, to give you a... My, because I'm sure there's people in here with a lot more, you know, they've been there, but this is, there's a lot of people on this meeting. There'll be, I reckon, about between 30 and 50% of the people on this meeting will have more time clean and sober than me. I've got, you know, like 17 years, 11 months, three weeks. There'll be people whose drinking and using caused them to have worse consequences. Maybe they used and drank more and had worse consequences. I am in about the middle of the bed. In fact, the first diagnosis I ever received from the first 12-step person I ever met said, yeah, he's a bog-standard alcoholic drug addict. That's how he described me when he asked what I was drinking and using, and I explained it to him. And when I explained my feelings and the way I was acting and the consequences. For me, um, like for the drinking, I just drank strong, cheap alcohol, and I drank all day. What I noticed was is that I felt nervous if I had to go to like uh, job interviews or if I had to interact with people. Uh, I found it, I felt very, very shy and awkward and afraid. And I noticed that if I drank sort of like, I don't know, a quart of some white spirit, vodka, tequila, gin, the kind of stuff that's like a bit off brand, you know, I mean, we're not talking good quality gear here, cheap, filthy stuff. But if I put that away, I'd be all right. I'd be able to interact with people and feel like relatively confident, you know? And then I thought, I remember thinking after like going to a job interview, like drunk, I think thinking, I'm going to do this all the time because I can cope with life like this. And that is what I did. I'm like, me, I'm a, a performer. So like job interviews for me normally involved like sort of showing off and that. But it used to really, really make me nervous. Like, I remember doing something once at, at a party. I was like doing the, like performing at a party once. I got very, very nervous about doing it. It was in a pub in Chalk Farm in North London. And they let the, those of us that were doing this performance prepare in the room where they kept the bottles of vodka, some cheap off brand vodka that they would replace the Smirnov vodka that they had up in the optics with some lousy thing. Kept boxes of it there by the litre. I nicked one bottle for later, gave one to my mate Mark. He was a dedicated alcoholic like me before we even uh before we even knew what those terms meant and um you know and i drank it you know it's like if you drink a lot of alcohol very very quickly you know like there's a sort of a 10 minute grace period where you think oh, i'm a badass i can handle this i sort of drank that liter of vodka had about 15 minutes where i thought like i was oliver reed or some sort of badass and then just as i got onto like stepped out in front of the people in this pub to do this little performance it was only about 50 people do you know what i mean it was no big deal like it hit me, it hit me like a juggernaut in my mind. Uh, like I, I really went for it. I felt very, very ill at ease. Uh, like some of the people weren't listening. I like took a glass from the bar, smashed it, cut myself with a glass, started offering people out, causing like causing a lot of ramifications. I went unconscious. The next thing I knew, I was being slapped around the face by a girlfriend of mine, like out on the street. Then the next thing I remember after that is I was in a friend's house. I pissed myself on his sofa, and like I just I, I left that situation and went and um, you know, like I, I like just left that house and went out and would try to score drugs uh, immediately. I never considered it possible 
that you could live life without drinking and using every day. It's all I did. It was my whole identity. My whole identity was that. Towards the end of, of my drinking and using, the problems became more dense. Like it became like that there was something, something went wrong like about once a week, you know, then about once a day that I would be either injured and would have to go to the hospital or would have a fight or would get arrested in, or, or would like lose a job or lose an opportunity or lose a relationship. The crises and calamities were quickening up. It was becoming faster and faster. This thing that I thought was my sol the solution to my problem quickly made the problem a lot worse. The problems were now, and I would never have been able to tell you this at the time. I can only tell you this now because I've been educated by people with more time and more experience than me. The problems, the problem I had was I felt disconnected. I felt purposeless. I felt like life had no meaning. Now, these problems are, are all spiritual problems. And when you think about it, even people that don't drink alcoholically, why are people drinking that don't drink alcoholically drinking? Because they want to feel better. The reason I drank is because I wanted to feel better. I wanted to feel better about me being me. I wanted to feel more connected. And for a while, it felt like it was doing that job. And for a while, it felt like it, just shut down my awareness of how bad things were you know like you know I told you like I was a, like, like I'm a performer or whatever it used to I used to think it made me better and then I realized it just made me not aware of how shit I was that's that's what I, I started to realize in time it just it shut down the awareness of how bad things were it escalated and the sort of places that I found myself were deteriorating and the people that I was drinking and using with were like, um, you know, criminal and destitute. And that, that's what I was fast becoming also. As I say, I was getting arrested, hospitalized. I still have like on um, my left leg here, I still carry this injury from a time I kicked my way through with like a glass fire escape door in a car with the security uh, venue I was working with, working at in Scotland. I was always getting myself into like fights, like talking myself into situations that I really, really couldn't handle, that I really, really wasn't qualified to deal with. And, you know, this injury on the leg was one such. My dear friend Martino, who's dead now, when he visited me in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, said, when he saw this leg, you better get used to telling that story because you're going to be telling it every time you wear short trousers. There's a scar like runs up the calf and up the shin. And when I was in the hospital bed having uh, the glass removed from the bone and the cartilage, they they said to me, like, uh, if that had gone an inch, I don't know, to the left or the right or whatever, that there's an artery or something there and they would have had to have amputated at the knee. And that, like I was still trying to score uh, in the hospital. I was drunk when that happened. The worst things happened to me when I was drunk. I was drunk most of the time. It became my whole life. It became devotional. You see, like how it says in the 12 step, um, carry this message to, uh, like, carry this message to um, newcomers and practice these principles in all our affairs. Well, I did practice the principles of being an alcoholic, an active alcoholic in all my affairs. I was drunk all the time. All of my decisions were made on that basis. You know, I handed over, that step three in this program, made a decision to, our life, to hand our life and our will over to the care of God as we understand God. I handed my life and my will over to alcohol every single day. Any situation I was in, alcohol can handle this situation for me if i'm nervous if i'm afraid if i'm heartbroken if i'm excited if i'm happy if i'm sad the alcohol was how i was going to handle it i think this word means spirit it's a uh it's a Ara arabic word al -kul. i think it's the magic or something isn't it someone on here will know it's the sort of fact that gets banded around in these type of rooms look what i'm saying is it was the center of my life i was devoted to it i was dedicated to it and one of the things that i think is crucial if you are new is the seeds of my sobriety were present in my drinking the very the the attributes that i require to be a man in recovery were already present when i was drinking and using I would commit to it. I'm 100% committed to it. It's not an option. There's no situation w w that is for me not appropriate to drink or using. Uh, in, like funerals, weddings, christenings, at work, doing driving lessons. I thought like, you know, I was 17 by then. I was like, well, I'll always be drunk when I'm driving. So I might as well do the driving lessons while drunk. That way I'll have learned it in this state and it will never be a surprise. <laughs> Uh, I didn't get my driving license until I was 35. So 
it's only a partially successful method, I would say, for learning a drive, the drunk driving method. <sighs> yeah, I was. Um, what I'm saying to you is that it was everything to me. That was my. I was drunk all the time. In fact, when someone heard that I had like um, I think it was like I was on a, f- a few weeks, maybe a few months sober. Um, my mate told someone oh Russell he's he's sober now he doesn't drink or use and she said what does he do then what does he do then because that's all I was that was my identity that's who I was you're not required what's your story oh dear no I'm afraid I'm busy you can't participate so that um I was lucky enough to go to a treatment centre. It was a 12-step treatment centre. And what they taught me was, you don't drink one day at a time. You're going to need to do all these steps and you're going to need to attend these meetings for the rest of your life. I sort of thought there would be some special and different way to do it. I really did. But it turns out that there isn't, that there hasn't been. That for me, the all of our stories vary. You know, some of our consequences were worse. I haven't been to prison yet. I haven't been to a lunatic asylum yet. It hasn't killed me yet. But it really caused me a lot of pain. And it, I caused a lot of pain and suffering in the lives of others. It's probably, you know, obviously there are nuanced variables in all our stories. But the solution, I think, is basically the same. Uh, I admitted I was powerless over alcohol and that my life had become manageable. That was pretty easy to do. My life was evidence of that. My relationships were failing. I was miserable and lost. I could do that. Step two can be hard for a lot of people. Came to believe that power great in ourselves could restore us to sanity. How I did that was by attending meetings and meeting other people that had got time in this program, people that had had worse that drank worse than I did, that had worse habits than me. I saw that they would got clean and sober, and I thought it must be possible. This power great in ourselves, the best thing I ever heard about it is, you know, people like to spend a lot of time pontificating on what the nature of this power might be, but all it really needs to do is move you from drinking every day to not drinking every day. December the 12th, 2002, there was no way that I could not drink. December the 13th, 2002, I didn't drink. And every single day since then, I have not found it necessary to drink. What happened? What is this power greater than myself that enabled this miracle to happen? It's really... Um... Hi, you guys. Oh, hi, you're sorry that I right. got lost. Thanks for second. having me back. What happened is, is that because I use my phone too much, because I'm addicted to it, I put this thing on your phone that can limit the amount of time you use social media apps. And Zoom is considered to be one of these social media apps. I thought, I'm only allowing myself one hour on social media (laughs) apps. So, like, after I've had one hour of social media apps, it's a fucking miracle that I got to nine o'clock at night with that. Let's face it. It cuts me off. Like, it cuts off. It don't let me use them anymore. Every single day, I have to unlock it again. Every single day, I have to go back for another 15 minutes on WhatsApp or another 15 minutes on whatever it is. There's no area of my life that is not contaminated by this condition of wanting more. There's no area of my life where I don't try and use an external thing to make me feel better. I'm still approaching 18 years utterly defined by my tendency towards addiction. And I have found that this program will work in every single area of my life. First thing I have to do is admit that I'm powerless, the same that I did with drugs and alcohol. The second thing I have to do is come to believe uh, that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity, that it is possible to live in a different way. It is possible, for example, to not use my phone for more than an hour a day. Then I have to do the third thing, which is make a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand God. 
I believe in God. I've got no problem believing in God. I love it. It's one of my favorite aspects of this program. How it works for me in a practical sense is I follow suggestion. Like I, another thing that I heard was very simple in this program from a, a, this guy called Tim who, who runs a wonderful resource called First 164 Blog. It's a fantastic blog. You should Google it, First 164. Like if you Google that, that's it's the first thing that comes up. Uh, he said, that step three made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. All that really needs to mean is that you now do step four. If you, if you make a decision to turn your life and your will over to the care of God, as you understand God, and you ask God or, you know, more likely your sponsor, what should I do now? What should I do next? Your sponsor will say, do step four. And if you've handed over your life and your will, you'll be, able to do step four i didn't want to do step four it took me five years and two days to do step four five years to not do it and then two days to do it i sat and just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote all of the resentments that i could remember and i could remember quite a lot of them in spite of everything step three for me enabled me to get beyond the patterns and habits that governed my life and what we're talking about really here are habits and tendencies firstly and most obviously a tendency to drink alcohol but anyone who's read the big book or the 12 and 12 or any of the other affiliated literature will surely testify that what is being spoken about in those pages is our tendency to grip to self-centeredness our tendency to lose ourselves in the ego in our individualism self-centeredness is the root of our dilemma you know no one can read the literature of alcoholics anonymous and think that they're not talking about something more profound and significant than a proclivity to use alcohol to dumb dull and alleviate the pressures of life you know a sentence like abandon yourself to god completely abandon yourself to god completely man they're talking about some serious stuff in this program you know i love the literature i love it i think it's a masterpiece i think bill w is a modern prophet that and in his white light experience received a download of something extremely profound i think the 12 steps is nothing less than a code for all or in consciousness and it's good that it's the likes of us desperate hopeless people that cannot fit in with this world that get to be the pioneers like the animals heading to the high land in the hurricane like the animals that know the flood is coming those of us that are desperate those of us that are lost those of us that simply cannot cope with life on life's terms we have no choice no choice either we have to drink ourselves to death or we have to have this program one of my favorite bits in the literature is um the choice to uh, to live a sober life or to die an alcoholic death and I'm not the choice whether to live on a spiritual basis or die an alcoholic death is not an easy one I love that oh, man that makes me die like a hmm shall I live a spiritual life or die an alcoholic death it's not an easy decision to make because there's alcoholic death over here and then spiritual life. Who wants to live a spiritual life, caring about others, being of service, being kind and compassion, compassionate, not living constantly in the ego? I heard someone say in a chair once, I'm addicted to myself. That's what I'm addicted to. I'm addicted to thinking about me all day long. What do I want? What can I get? What can I do next? So for me, step four, the um, inventory part of this process, and just to recap, one, I've got a problem. Two, it's possible to not have a problem. Three, on my own, I won't solve this problem. I'm a fucking idiot. I'm going to have to ask for help. But once I've taken those three steps, time for some serious work, inventory, everything that's ever happened. That's what I had to do the first time. Every single resentment I can remember, every time I've ever been jealous, envious, prideful, any time that I've ever had my heart broken, any time I've ever treated anyone else badly, page after page of this stuff, scratched out in column after column, exhausting process. Then step five, share i shared it with my sponsor um and that that did a remarkable job for me step four it was not an empty exercise you know like sometimes when you're doing these things you're doing them because someone's told you to do it and they never really get that effective step four really gave me a different perspective on my life step four told me why it was necessary for me necessary for me to drink and use drugs because i was in so much pain because there was so much stuff i was ill at ease with that i was 
couldn't cope in the world. I couldn't cope with the world. Step five alleviated the shame that I felt. Any alcoholic I've spoke to at length, they experience a great deal of fear and a great deal of shame. Shame, the idea that there's something fundamentally wrong with me, that I'm dirty, worthless, broken. That if people knew me as I really am, they wouldn't love me. They wouldn't care for me. After I finished that step five with my sponsor, old school guy, he was sat there smoking fags. I mean that in the English sense throughout the whole process. It, the most terrible things that I could remember right, when I told him, yeah, that's no big deal. I've done something like that. <laughs> things that were so trivial, I couldn't believe that they'd stayed in my memory. Things that happened to me on sports day when I was five years old were in there with the most devastating examples of humiliation and sexual abuse that I've been on the receiving end. All of this big swirl of stuff, none of it made a bit of difference to him. It was all the same to him. He identified with most of it. And I felt unburdened and I felt that shame shift and I felt this inability that I've always felt to connect with other people start to hmm, thaw. I felt a connection. I felt a connection. I once saw this beautiful documentary about our fellowship where um, Dr. Bob, the co-founder, speaking of his first meeting with Bill W, said that after he'd listened to the younger man, this... Uh, scoundrel vagabond stock stockbroker drunk by then a sober man explain the nature of his condition at a meeting at dr bob's house where he told his wife just after 15 minutes come in and cut this dude off and get him out the door because this is going to be boring i've got a bad feeling about it and the men spoke all night at the first ever aa meeting drinking coffee after coffee he said, Dr. Bob said that after listening to the man describe his disease, to describe the way he felt, to describe describing the thoughts that went through his head, he said, oh, my God, you have it too. You have it too. And he said, something passed between us. Something passed between us. When we hear one another share vulnerably, when we hear each other not posturing about, oh, I'm great, I can do this, I've got that, I've had all these achievements and these successes. When someone says to you, the way that I speak to the men that I'm honoured to share my home group with, we talk about our feelings of inferiority, our feelings of inadequacy, our shame, our guilt, and the way that we're processing it. And how do we process it? We process it through this programme. We admit there's a problem, we believe it can get better, we become willing to accept help, we inventory it, step four. And when I unburdened myself that first ever time that I did a step five with my then sponsor, I felt alleviated and I felt somewhat cleansed. I did immediately nearly get arrested straight after that because I also had some weird cathartic explosive moment in Malibu in Los Angeles where I was at the time where I'd done this process. Some people wanted to come in the house where I was. I go, you ain't coming in the house. I lost it. You know, you can still be pretty crazy. I can fuck my life up plenty good without alcohol or drugs in me. I've, I've still got the gift. Anyway, I got through that little event. With step four and five done, we move on to six. I become willing to remove my defects of character. My defects of character are revealed to me by undertaking this inventory process. Now, I've written all this stuff down now. All that stuff that happened to me when I was a kid, when I got touched up, all the things I've done that I'm ashamed of, it's all down on paper. It's all been broken down. I've looked at what it is in myself that caused me to do that according to the big book method. That's the way I've done it. Old school OG technique. Having explained all this stuff, um, shared all of this stuff i can now have an honest look at what's up and i discovered i was shown that i had some pretty serious defects of character the defects of character are the emotional programming that underlie our alcoholic tendencies i was taught that these are, are some good examples of it pride self-pity self-centeredness selfishness intolerance impatience greed gluttony lust dishonesty arrogance and like Every time I was explained, and like it says in 12 and 12, any time that I've got a problem with someone else, there's something wrong with me also. This state of spiritual enlightenment, spiritual awakening that we are pursuing, according to step 12, means a state of freedom. The, like the promises say, and like the great Sandy Beach, God rest his eternal soul, one of the great AA speakers, check that dude out. Like he says, he says, look at the language in the promises. Self-seeking, self-seeking will slip away. What happened to your self-seeking? Didn't you used to be a real self-seeking person? Yeah, yeah, I was really self-seeking. What happened? I don't know, it just slipped away. What about that fear of people and economic insecurity? It just left me. It fucking comes back, let me tell you. But like what I'm saying is, I imagine as someone once told me with the Old Testament Ten Commandments, you could consider it, that to, uh, you could consider adding the prefix when you are awakened, 
when you are enlightened. When you are enlightened, thou shall not steal. When you are enlightened, thou shall not kill. When you are enlightened, thou shall not commit adultery. You don't want to do none of that stuff if you're awakened. Same with the promises. When you are awakened, when you've done these steps, when you thoroughly followed our path, like it said in the preamble there, fear of economic insecurity will leave you. And as Sandy Beach brilliantly points out, doesn't mean economic insecurity will leave you. Fear of economic insecurity will leave you. You will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle you. What these promises, the step nine promises, as to give them their full name, mean to me is that if I do this work, I will experience freedom. I will not be going through life with my little begging bowl out in front of me, asking for approval, asking for other people to take care of my emotions, asking other people to look after me, far less drinking drugs. And drinking a drug, getting that out of the way, that's just the beginning and no disrespect to any of you that are at the beginning of this journey because I obviously know how hard it is to give up drugs and alcohol it's really really hard once you've done that though you have to give up the person that needed the drugs and alcohol and that's the process that is still ongoing for me and the process that i'm finding most rewarding i became willing to let go of pride i became willing to let go of self-pity it was described to me thusly self-pity is indulging your own misery tasting your own misery like wine savoring your own misery not just feeling sadness and grief because of the many difficult things that happen in the life of an individual and in the cycle of a planet and a society but enjoying it reveling in it identifying it with it poor me oh no i've had such a tough time self-centeredness that tendency to place myself at the core of everything these are the things that i have to work with i still experience them on a daily basis but now i know when i feel them that they are a spur a cue to change oh i'm being really greedy i must have let go of my program because i'm thinking that if i have all of this chocolate I'm going to be okay, or I'm greedy for my own way. Oh, wow, I'm feeling envious or jealous. That must mean I've lost contact with God. Because when I'm in contact with God, I'm cool with reality. However reality wants to be, that's cool with me. Reality is none of my business. My life is none of my business. I've had my job explained to me. My job is carry this message, serve God, practice these principles. In some of your affairs, no, all of your affairs, the way that you think, the way that you speak, the way that you act, the way I speak to my dog, the way that I bring my kids up, the way I conduct my business life, all my affairs. I should be handing over my will. And and now in my little list here, uh, I was at step seven, humbly ask God to remove these defects of character, these defects of character. I suppose, as it says again in the 12 and 12, in, instincts gone awry, natural human instincts to want to have sex, lust excessive sex natural human instinct to want to acquire stuff greed excessive the impulse gone awry you know i was explained to me that step seven humbly ask god to remove our defects of character here's some things that i like about step seven i like the idea that they are removed like i don't have to do anything except become willing in the previous step and do all that other work that i've already described they will be removed and we ask god humbly this god of our own understanding because i know a lot of people some people don't like to believe in god because you know for so so many reasons but for me this program this spiritual program whether it's step 11 or step 7 or step 2 or step 1 for me the belief in god is is fundamental or a higher power of my own understanding obviously not the same god as you believe in but the god i believe in loving benevolent oneness that wants me to succeed and be compassionate and kind and wants me as it was explained to me to recover the person i was intended to be it was explained to me that that's what the word recovery means we recover the person we were intended to be as if we were a tree that will grow to its own fulfillment unless it's not given the correct environment and none of us were given the correct environment and all of us have this condition don't we but we know that we have individual dna and individual fingerprints and surely we have an, an individual self that we can actualize step 12 we have a spiritual awakening. We become the person we were intended to be. If we can remove these defects of character, if all of my thoughts and feelings aren't going through a lens of greed, lust, self-centeredness, self-pity, pride. Pride, I was taught, means I have an opinion about what your opinion is of me. Thanks to this program, I don't care what other people think of me, as they say is none of my business. My job is to remain connected with a higher power of my own understanding, act in accordance with these principles, then that's all cool. Because 
the reality that goes on in other people's heads is a complicated thing. I don't know what's going on in there. That's none of my business. My business is help others clean house, be of service. That's it. That's it. I've had it explained to me very plainly. Step eight is I go back and I look at my life and I look at all the people that I've harmed as a result of my drinking and using and behavior more broadly. And I become willing to make amends to them all. That means I do the step eight as if there was no step nine. I just go, yeah, this happened, this happened, this happened. I did this, I did that. And in the event that someone did something to me, I become willing to forgive them. Forgiveness is absolutely vital. I find it easier to forgive people for, you know, the great transgressions in my past than I do for the trivialities of the present day. Someone says a wrong word to me, I'm like, I'm ready to kill them. I'm much better at being wrong than being right. If I'm wrong, people, and I talk to my sponsor or another person whose opinion I respect in this program, and they say, yeah, 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 you're wrong. I'm like, oh, what a relief. I can just make amends. I can just apologize promptly and let go of it. If someone says to me, you're right, that person's mugged you right off. Ah. Then the fury is with me, the fury of righteousness. The flaming sword is coming out then. <laughs> Step eight, <clears throat> I make a list of all people that are harmed. I become willing to make amends to them all. Give money back where necessary. <clears throat> Apologize where required. <clears throat> Step nine, I make amends unless to do so would make shit worse. You know, sometimes truth is an inappropriate thing. Excuse me, I'm laying down and I've swallowed. I know when you feel that feeling. <coughs> yeah, so like I am, um, I, I continue to make amends. I continue to try and live a different life now. If my life before, if my, if my life before was defined by selfishness and self-centeredness, by thinking of other people primarily as a resource to make me feel better, and I can still return to this. I can still think, is this person going to be useful to me? Are they going to make me feel better about myself in some way? Even powerful people, if I meet someone that is powerful, I think I look at them as if they're a vessel that I can fill myself up from. All these things now, all these thoughts, all these impulses, as I say to you, are a cue, a spur to return to my mandated process with the method I was taught in this program, you're meant to be a being of service. I've got no role in this world. Ah. Oh, hello. I mean, it's God in reverse. Hello, mate. What do you want? What do you need now? Um, no, I can't help you. I'm in the middle. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in virtual Dublin in a cyber AA meeting. So that so I can keep myself sober and keep you in dog biscuits there he is there's the lad what well, that's what it's all about so I, I step nine is an ongoing thing for me it's called amends i was taught because i amend the way that i was i amend the way that i am i'm no longer that person i'm walking a different path now it, the process of conducting step nine was when i really felt the sacredness of this program perhaps along with step five i suppose i was taught this is how you make a step nine you go to the person and you say, as you know, I'm an alcoholic. Part of my recovery from alcoholism is that I make amends to people I have wronged. I've harmed you and I owe you an amends. Then I describe the nature of the wrong that I committed and I describe the amends that I would like to offer them. Then I say, is there anything else they want to add and anything else they would like for me? As soon as I hear myself saying them words at the beginning, I feel like I'm, it's like a chalk circle, like a sacred circle is drawn. I feel myself going to a different space. That's really the action. Admit there's a problem. Believe it's possible to change. Hand over my will. Recognize that I'm going to need help and help from a group help from a high power of my own understanding do the inventory that's step four share the inventory that's step five S step six come willing to let go of the stuff that i've discovered from doing that inventory step seven humbly ask for it to be removed someone explained to me the reason we humbly ask because it's very hard to let go of pride it's very hard to let go of lust and to know the pain that's going to be there because these things are all strategies for survival why do people become aggressive because that's the technique that worked. Why do people become promiscuous? That's the technique that worked. Someone said to me when I first got clean, well done. Well done for becoming a heroin addict. You found a way to not commit suicide. She was herself a sober alcoholic. Well done. 
and I felt she understood me, that woman. It was one of the first people that I thought, oh, she understands. She understands. She's not going, it's a bit weird, wasn't it, to become a junkie? No. She knows. It was that or suicide. They were the options. Step nine, you make the amends. Now, once you've done all that stuff, the final three steps are known as the maintenance steps. Step 10, continue to take personal inventory, and when we're wrong, promptly admit it. That means I stay aware, and I notice if I feel in my belly, anger, sadness, fear, greed. I feel these things every single day. When I feel these things, I check in with them. If I harm anyone as a result of acting on those feelings, I promptly admit it and I make an amend. Step 11, sort through prayer and meditation. Um, through prayer and meditation, sort conscious contact with a higher power of our own understanding, seeking only knowledge of his will for us or God's will for us and the power to carry that out. Step 11, I love it because that's the thing that, don't you think sometimes of alcoholics and drug addicts that they are trying to do the thing that we are learning in this program? They are trying to destroy themselves. They are trying to get rid of the self, but they're trying in the wrong way. You know, think of what it's like to be an active alcoholic. You know, some of you might be for two days, 30 days, 60 days. I don't know. It takes real commitment. It takes real dedication. It takes real devotion. I treated each phase of my accumulating and evolving addiction like it was a new messiah, dedicated to chocolate, devoted to pornography, a absolute servant of alcohol. Well, this devotion, this dedication, this willingness to commit will be of great service to you in your recovery because people will say to you you don't drink or take drugs anymore now one day at a time and you will say thank you that's right i don't you will attend 90 meetings in 90 days yes ma'am i will do it we would like you to go and help that newcomer yes absolutely the more things you do that you don't want to do as long as you trust the people that are telling you it and they are people working this program not just some random lunatic off the street because if you're listening to an alcoholic and what they're telling you hasn't come from this program you're listening to a drunk is what i was taught but if you're listening to someone who's on point with their program you can trust them and in fact the the fact that we're doing things that don't come naturally to us that's what change is change means you're doing something that you wouldn't normally do when i call up my sponsor saying this thing's happened this is my this is what i'm thinking of doing and he says don't do that. Do this. I do what he says. And that means I'm already changed. I'm a different person. Forget the neuroplasticity that must be inspired by not having all those chemicals in me. I'm making different decisions. I'm walking a different path, both neurologically and literally in life. New path, new direction. Again, because of this program and the relationships in it. Step 10, stay sensitive. Step 11, stay connected. That becomes the basis of my life. And I get to do the thing that I wanted to do my whole life in the first place. Get out of my head. Be free from this thinking, this incessant thinking. Step 12, as I've mentioned many times over the course of this chat, you know, I became willing to, uh, I practice these principles in all my affairs and carry the message. So for me, step 12 is I do service at meetings. I look for ways to help people with drug and alcohol problems. And I practice that just for today card stuff, you know, of trying to do stuff and then not tell anybody about it. Because so, even doing good things, sometimes I would do it because I want people's approval. Well, if I do good things and no one knows about it, then it's just between me and God. It's just between me and my truest, purest self. For me, the God is the God in the heart and in the belly not an external abstract God, the God that's talking to me all the time as C.S. Lewis, one of the inspirations behind uh, Bill W.'s construction of the big book says, we all know when that voice in us says, mm -mm, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. He says, whilst cultures across the world may vary, in some cultures, a person may marry many people. And in other cultures, you may marry just one, you know, there is no culture where someone is applauded for running away in battle. There's no culture where people are encouraged to betray their friends. There are some things that are universal. There are some things that are 
stitched deeply into our being. It's the God in my belly that I believe in, and I believe it's across all of us. I do believe that we're all connected. This program has taught me that we're all connected, and it's shown me ways to make the connections. This program has given me everything that I was looking for with drugs and alcohol. Purpose, connection, a system to, for, to, in, to behave in compliance with, in alignment with gets me out of my head through the prayer and the meditation this is what i think this program works if you're having trouble then i would run this checklist what is your home group what meetings are you going to what is your relationship with your sponsor like how many people are you sponsoring where are you on the steps what part of the literature are you reading at the moment what's your prayer and meditation like if they if some of you're not doing some of those things, then that's where the problem is. If you're happy, then that's all great. Because like it says in our literature, happy, joyous, and free. Happy, joyous, and free. And that more is going to be revealed to us. This I truly feel. That we are, this idea, 70, 80 years old now, since this um, great idea in its current form came into fruition. I think a lot more is going to be revealed to us. I, the, being an alcoholic and a drug addict is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's shown me we're all wounded, alcoholics, drug addicts, non-alcoholics, drug addicts. We're all wounded. We're all damaged. For me, it was so bad that I had to find a solution. But the solution has been magic. Let me tell you now, one week away from 18 years, if I get there, I'm married. I'm faithful to my wife, and I don't just mean in a, a fidelity way. I mean, I, she's, I'm her servant. I'm her servant. she got nothing to worry about with me, you know? I'm not trying to manipulate her or control her, maybe a little bit sometimes, but I immediately speak, oh, no, stop being manipulative and controlling. Nothing to get there. I'm a father to two children. I live in the same house as them. I'm dedicated to them. I make mistakes every day. I'm human. You know, it's like kids. It's bloody exhausting, isn't it? I, you know, when I come into this, I was living on benefits. I was a crack and heroin addict. Now, now, most importantly, I suppose, I have peace of mind. I'm not looking for other people to make me feel better about myself. I'm completely content. I'm completely happy. I see everybody is the same as me, not better than me or worse than me. And I'm just happy to be of service. I can't believe that something that was dreamt up in the United States of America in the 1930s can be so effective. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I've met some of the most beautiful people in the world through, through this program. And I've had some of the best experiences in my life. Without this, I would drink and use. I don't know how quickly. I don't know how quickly because I get miserable pretty quick if I don't practice the principles of this program. So I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to be just another alcoholic drug addict trying to cope with this disease by using this program um i'll wrap it up there cheers with you thanks for listening i hope you enjoyed the podcast sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links Thank you very much.